Welcome to the Business Success Strategies with Adrian McLean. This is a 30-minute interview with successful business people who have been able to achieve amazing results with growing a business. Business Success Strategies is proudly sponsored by The Speaker's Practice and AdrianMcLean.com, helping business owners with marketing and promotions with a specialty with public speaking. Enjoy today's Business Success Strategies interview. Welcome to the Business Success Strategies interview. We're thrilled you can join us. Today, we have Denise Archie from the Coaching College with us. Denise Archie is recognised as one of Australia's pioneers in online learning, having set up one of the first online learning training academies in 1995. She is a passionate educator from the classroom to the boardroom inspiring people to see the potential within themselves and to create their magnificence in the world. Denise has been inducted as an honorary fellow of the Teachers Guild of New South Wales in recognition of her lifelong commitment and contribution to education. Denise has a reputation for bringing learning to life regardless of the subject matter. Welcome, Denise. It's wonderful to have you with us on the Business Success Strategies interview. Thank you, Adrian. It's great to be here. And I look forward to uh, unfolding what the uh, myths and legends are about uh, you know, women who lead uh, their family business. So thank you. Oh, well, this is it's such a big topic today, uh, being on the essential skills for women leading their family business and uh, gosh uh, family business comes with all sorts of challenges doesn't it absolutely absolutely yes. so we're going to have a look at that and uh, and when the women uh, the mothers or the daughters are running the business uh, there's all sorts of challenges within the business and within the family home life that have to be uh, managed isn't there absolutely and I guess one of the the funniest thing growing up is that all my relatives uh, including my you know immediate uh, family parents were all because they had migrated to Australia it seemed a natural thing for them to set up their businesses so they were in you know the the clothing or the schmutter business they were in um in selling shoes. So my mum and my aunt had been selling shoes it, at uh, the markets here in Sydney for about 20 years and they had different outlets. And so my boys learned to count because they'd have to go with, on the days that I was working, uh, <laughs> they'd, ha they'd have to pair up the shoes. So they learned wow. very quickly about matching and pairing. And, and so for them, being around a family unit in a workspace was a very natural thing that they've all grown up in. And yeah. so for me, being in, in the classroom and recognising that perhaps there was other opportunities to, you know, allowed me to then step away from the more structured in learning environment into creating space for, for learning. Because as you know, Adrian, everybody learns differently. And for me, on the days that I went to school, it wasn't, you know, a great, great excitement. So, of course, <laughs> teaching and learning has been really the, the backbone of everything I've done. I always take on some new learning every year, from singing to dancing, from drama. So for me, it's it's a it's a lifelong fun things. And yeah. as we're talking today about family business, that's the challenge of managing all those things with your own self interest is also really important. Yes, and uh, women, uh, I know that men have this too, but. But women do have a nurturing role. They have uh, the the often, you know, we're part of a sandwich generation. So there's elderly parents that need to be looked after. There's the home life, uh, and then there's all the work commitments as well. And uh, we try to be everything to everyone, but it's just not possible, is it? <laughs> No, it's not. It's really a myth about, you know, this work-life balance because it really is about how does all of you turn up? And we talk in, you know, in our workshops about who gets the crumbs. 
So sometimes one of the challenges is around decision-making, just simply for yourself. And for some women, you know, decision-making is very much part of them. But we also have that underlying current of, you know, wanting to be liked or doing the right thing or being good, which then impacts often on our decision-making ability. So we ask then who gets the crumbs, you know. So are you making all the decisions at work that when you come home, and, you know, and someone says to you, oh, what would you like for dinner? You go, I don't know, don't ask me, because it means another decision to be made and you'd use your voucher at work. <laughs> so one of the challenges, of course, is how do you balance all of this? And, and decision-making becomes a really important skill mm-hmm. across, the, across the, you know, your own business and also making those decisions within your family. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Okay, well, we have our five questions. So uh, the first question is, How did you get started in your family business? Well, as I mentioned, it just became innate. And and I know when I was pregnant with my second son, I have three sons, pregnant with my second son, uh, I had stopped working and I decided I would set up a swimming school. And so, you know, being a swimmer myself, it seemed a natural progression. (laughs) And I suddenly suddenly had 35 uh, children that I was teaching to swim in my mum's backyard. And I remember going into labour sort of telling oh. everybody they better get <laughs> they better get out of the pool because I didn't think my parents would fancy a a, a birth you know the, the water birth <laughs> so it's really been and I, I know with my children you know I have always actively encouraged I remember one time they decided they would make uh, some popcorn and I said oh why don't you make a popcorn stand so the two big boys were down the bottom of the street us, uh, yeah, at the bottom of the street, my youngest one was running backwards and forwards with the containers of popcorn and they were selling popcorn. So it really is around understanding the fun of business, you know, and, and biz- we're all, if you find what you love, it doesn't matter what you do, then that's the, the joy. So mm. I've been really setting up businesses, selling, working in my, in you know, in the, in the family business. When I was at Teachers College, I worked with my mum and my aunt you know, selling shoes at the markets with my cousins. Mm. When uh, my dad had, you know, a spare parts business and I'd go in over the holidays, so much so that he had a switchboard. And for some of you young enough to remember, it was one of those that you put the plugs in oh, and you had to hand crank <laughs> to phone downstairs. Oh. So I've always been in a, in a, in a family business, really, mm. yeah. And that's the thing uh, with family business and small business that everybody gets involved. It's just, uh, you, you, you know, you'll be doing one thing one yeah. day and one thing the next. And exactly. It's just yeah. what you do, what needs to be done. Exactly. So my middle son came into the business for five minutes because uh, he, he was teaching and he uh, was then, you know, had met this lovely woman and they went to the state so I said well why don't you come and work in the business because you know how will you how will you live because in America of course you need a green card to get a job and you've got it once you've got a job you can get a green card so there was this continual loop so we're really excited we celebrate 14 years this year working together and one of the challenges is around how do you balance that you know because over the time He's grown, he's developed, I've grown and I've developed. And, and what we've done to make things work, which at times can be, you know, still a bit mother-son, yeah. uh, has been to really work out where which puddle we're going to play in. And mm-hmm. once we decided which puddle we were playing in, it didn't mean we didn't understand the other puddle, but it just gave the ownership of the one puddle. Mm-hmm. And that made a huge difference. And I think one of the things that's really important in a family business is to have clarity around the roles and responsibilities. Yes, yeah. Oh, that's that's really important. And uh, and then you're not sort of going over each other's toes, so to speak. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. And the and when when we were living when we were living in when he was living in America, we'd have our in the early days of Skype, we would have a, a separate Skype channel open. And so we'd be busy talking to, you know, a potential client and and we'd be providing, you know, suggested ideas that one could lead. So you're really co-facilitating and making sure that what is being communicated has that same shared vision. So the second thing is to make sure you have a shared understanding of the business 
and where you want the business to grow. Fantastic. Okay. Well, our next question is, what are some of the challenges faced by women leading a business? I think if I remember back, you mentioned that we were one of the first in online learning in Australia. Mm. So it was part of the, and this, I guess, looks at how things have changed, although I wonder how much. And so we were two women in our 40s in the tech industry. Mm. And we had a venture capitalist fly, a group of venture capitalists fly us down to Melbourne. And we were sitting at the table and they were putting figures on the on the table of, you know, $50 million. And we just looked at each other, just seemed incredulous. Mm. Anyway. One of them said to me, and I still remember, who's behind you? And I remember physically looking to see who was behind me. <laughs> but he meant what male was actually behind us because, remember, we were two women running an IT company, which yeah. in those, you know, late 19, you know, the 1990s, early 2000s, it was really unheard of. Yeah. So fortunately things have changed. Yeah. I wonder how much, though. And so we start to think about what does that mean for women who are leading a business? You know, what happens around their level of confidence when they go into a meeting? What happens around some of the, the ways in which they conduct the, themselves in a meeting? You know, what are the practices? How are they making sure people sit where it's actually con more conducive to them than what it is for the client or the person they're speaking with? So there are some real techniques that I have learned over the time that are really useful for women, particularly wanting to manage the process without appearing to dominate. And so it's around that very process of being assertive and working out where does assertive begin and end and where does it perceived to begin and end. And I think that's really important. Yes, it's just thinking that perception is so important in this, especially when you, you, you're you up there pitching for business or yes. pitching for finance. Uh, yes. Uh, it, it, the perception of what's going on from the others is really important. And I think the other thing to consider sometimes is the relationship. So we have a model called the five R's and it's around the relationships. And sometimes if you've been working in the business and you've grown with it, then you have the credibility of, you know, long-serving uh, team members. Mm -hmm. The challenge sometimes happens is when you've come externally into a family business and suddenly you've got to establish your credibility. You had it outside, but you've almost like you're the new kid on the block again mm -hmm. and you've actually got to start from the beginning and take that time to do that is becomes really important and grow the relationships in a slightly different way. So it's it's an important thing to remember. I was consulting in a very large organisation. There was the father and the two sons. And the challenge was that the father was such a dominant figure across the organisation. There were so many things that surrounded him about, you know, that the people would make up things, how fabulous he was. Mm -hmm. And the sons had a real challenge doing that. Now, they had a daughter, but the daughter didn't even get a look in. And I remember we were, you know, working on, on a project and which was really important to her, but she didn't have a voice. Mm. And so you start to have a look, what's the balance around the meetings? Where is the way? And an, an easy way to start on that is to make sure that you're chairing the meetings. Mm. Because when you chair a meetings, it gives you a certain amount of authority. And sometimes you can be given the authority without the responsibility or accountability. So that's sometimes another challenge. And so you want to start to make sure that not only do you have the responsibility and the accountability, but you also have the authority. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is to have a public decree. So when you're stepping into a role that, you know, your father or your mother or whoever it is in your family that you are stepping into a role, it needs to be a public announcement. So it must have a public degree because that will give the new person and the woman taking on that role the accountability and the credibility. Yes, yes, because uh, it is quite easy to to for a woman to go into a, a situation where her voice isn't heard. Absolutely. 
And so that level of frustration where we call it the, the loud or the silent kiss of death, where you know that you've got to, you know, something needs to happen to improve because, you know, people go into business for three reasons, as you would know. You know, one is to afford the, you know, to have a lifestyle, although sometimes that's a bit, bit of a myth. <laughs> the second is to break that, but honestly. <laughs> uh, the second is to, you know, manage your own destiny. Hmm. And the third is to give you the, the sense of, of creativity that often isn't uh, perhaps encouraged. And so if you start to look at those three reasons or whatever reasons other people then decide they want to be in the family business, the most important thing is is the relationships and the accountability. And what skills do the people that you're leading actually need to have a relationship with you? Because, you know, sometimes they've been very used to doing what they've always done and you're wanting to introduce something that's very different. And I'm sure, you know, lots of people who do training and consulting have that same thing, except in a family business it's different because what you're doing is you have to prove even more about what your idea is and that it's right. Because there is a family uh, construct uh, there and uh, that's taken uh, lifetimes to build and probably generations and absolutely uh, and and newcomers to that uh, it will take a bit of time and it does you know and and being really clear around what your intent and your purpose is to actually be in that role mm-hmm. being really clear on that okay well let's go on to our third question which is What are some of the opportunities available today for women in business? Oh, I think it's wonderful opportunities. I think there's a certain expectation that women will collaborate more efficiently and effectively. I think there's an openness for discussion and ideas and shared ideas. And it's, you know, you look around and there's so many platforms now for women to actually step into being part of, you know, part of a change. Mm. And you look at some of the micro businesses that were supporting, you know, that's being supported around the world because once women have a a source of income, they are very much around educating and feeding their families. You know, it's a very natural nurturing position. Mm. I guess one of the things that's important in, in working with other women is that there's not a sense of competition, but there's a sense of, of cooperation and because just imagine you know some people who are quite competitive how could they handle every piece of business it's impossible so I remember being in a in a group which will remain nameless and uh, you know you had to only have one type of business in that group and I actually said you know if all the people in this business and all their connections actually came to you could you manage that business? Well, of course they couldn't. No. And so I think that the biggest thing is, is, is to see how can you collaborate, how can you actually look at the skills that you have and what are some of the bits that if you found someone else with a complementary set of skills, where could that take you, yeah. you know? And I think that's what's really exciting. That's really, really exciting. And there are lots of opportunities available now for women uh, I think uh, the TAFE courses have some things and the government's doing some mentoring for female founders. So there's things opening up to support women in business. Absolutely. And and RTOs, registered training organisations that offer. And, of course, you know, you're looking at something that that for you, where is the gap? And so sometimes you've got to do a bit of a self-analysis too. You know, Mm -hmm. if I'm going to be in this role for the next three years, what do I want it to look like? And so, what, and also, what is your succession plan? You know, who, who are you bringing up the rear? It may or may not be a family member. And so, how do you start to think about what that succession plan look like? Because the biggest opportunity I see is the opportunity for growth. And if you have an openness and a willingness to learn, then it becomes exponential around that learning. And then you, you're making sure that all the things that you're putting in place are solid and that someone else can actually work with it. Because remember, your systems always have to be bigger than where your business is right now. Yes. 
Yes. And just on the side, Denise, what's your uh, approach for juggling all the balls? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny you say that. <laughs> Uh, we actually teach juggling. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah. Uh, well, I think <laughs> how do you manage priorities? Well, it's the same thing. It's competing priorities. Mm. And so I think one of the things that that my you know that Marcus is really good at is he's very much a a structure and a you know managing those priorities. And I've certainly learnt from him. And I think that's the other thing is really understanding the skills that your you know business partner or whatever whoever it is in the business that actually isn't you're not so great at you know mm -hmm. and he's excellent he'll say you know he'll work off a list and I, I'm really good at setting up a list and then you know something else will be a bit more interesting for me <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I think it's important that you recognize that within yourself as well yeah, yeah. Well, we're all good at things, and uh, and what we get, what we prefer not to do, we can delegate. <laughs> that's exactly, exactly. And that's what I say, you know, to to women: find what you love. You know, look at all the aspects of the business. So, you know, whether it be financial administration, sales, marketing, you know, client uh, business development. So you look at that whole section, and you work out what makes your heart sing. And they're the ones that you play with. So I love writing programs. I love facilitating. I love looking at what's the possibility of, of adding another piece, you know, to the puzzle. And so for me, there's always something new, whereas for Marcus, he's a strong completer. And so he likes things finished, whereas I keep saying, well, you know, we could do a little bit more. So my challenge is, is to stop and actually finish so, um, you know, there's three things that set up a win, and this is really important for all of the people listening today. What constitutes a win for you? Is it the creative spirit? Is it that you're a strong completer? Or is it that you like maintaining things? So if you find that you are a completer and you work off lists and you find you stay really late at night until the list is done, then that's probably not useful to yourself or your family. So maybe putting the 25 things on a list is unrealistic. So does your week have to be from a Monday to a Friday? Couldn't it be from a Wednesday to a Wednesday? So you start to look at other possibilities if you are liking to work off a list. Now, if you like your creative, you know, if that creativeness is, is within you mm -hmm. and problem solving, people often say, you know, I love the challenge. And so really it's problem solving. And I know when I... I've worked and women are great problem solvers and they love solving the problem mm -hmm. and often that can mean to a person perception we talked about is that you're actually not trusting them to come up with a solution so mm -hmm. if you love problem solving work out what you can do that will enhance the relationship mm -hmm. not necessarily take things away from the relationship mm -hmm. oh, that's very important okay well that uh, yes, that follows on from our fourth question, which is some of the recommendations. Um, what are the recommendations you have for balancing work and home life? <laughs> Let's not talk about balancing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about integrating, blending, embedding, uh, contextualising, customising. <laughs> There's so many other words that are probably more relevant. So I think what Don't it is. Think I, think that's in there. <laughs> I think what it is is you work out what is your day, what do you want your day to look like? So <laughs> I have this thing in my head and I don't know why. If I haven't swum in the morning by eight o'clock, it's too late. Oh. Now I don't know why that is. I have no idea. So I'm actually wanting to move myself a little bit past eight o'clock, mm -hmm. which is sometimes, you know, so what is it that you have in your head? That's, you know, we talk about constraints. It's like the elephant, you know, when they're first little and they have a stake with a, uh, a chain to their ankle. Mm -hmm. and even though they get bigger and they could easily pull that stake out, the elephant is so constrained and so conditioned that they actually don't. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you are conditioned for or to right now? And I think if people sort of actually thought about that, then they go, well, wait a minute, what had happened if? 
And then you start to do that link. What had happened if I swam in the afternoon? What had happened if I swam after eight o'clock on some days? You know, so I've started to practice that. It's never too late. I'm still breathing. And so, <laughs> and so I think if we have a look at ourselves and go, what is it that is our own constraint that we've never thought of before? And maybe every, you know, once a week we actually undo the chain that may be around the stake and actually let go of that constraint. Wow. Oh, wow. That's a bit of a... <laughs> I, I, know you, I know you're thinking of something, Adrian. <laughs> <gasps> yeah, and it's and it's really a step by step process, you know. So, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Oh well, thank you so much, Denise. Now you have a special uh, giveaway, and uh, we'd like to hear a bit more about your business. Okay, so I'm an inventor, and so I invent act, you know, uh, products, and so. One of the, and I'd love to sell lots of our products because then I can get my car in the garage much more easily. So <laughs> one, <of> a <laughs> true story. So one of the products that we have is goal setting made simple, and what it is, it's a program that actually encourages people to really think about their goals, mm -hmm. and particularly for women, the goals that they're setting for themselves. So there's eight areas in our life that it looks at. And those eight areas look at our self and well-being, our home and family, our business and career. We look at our um, the, the work we do in community and humanity and some of the things that we want to look at around our business as well. And so we have a giveaway of our goal-setting uh, kit made, or goal-setting made simple, which we call Mapping My Life for Change. And so what we'd like to do, if you can put into the chat yeah. your reason for wanting to win in less than 25 words, our Mapping for Life for Change Goal Setting Kit, your, we'll see who the winner is. Wow. And plus, what we'll do is we'll include a 30-minute coaching session to get you going. Oh, fantastic. Wow. Oh. So our Goal Setting Kit has a daily journal and diary that yeah. you can sit on your desk. It's got a vision board oh. that you can uh, use and comes with stickers. All oh, right. So what, we have uh, two businesses. One is Coaching College where we deliver coaching and mentoring uh, programs into organisations. And we have another company which is called the Australasian Centre for Work Education, which is a registered training organisation where we deliver leadership and management qualifications. Mm -hmm. And so we bring our, it doesn't matter what the, 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 the content is or the topic, as you said, we actually bring it to life in a way that's very unique. Our programs are multiple award winning for the, over the last 15 years. And what we've been able to achieve is when organisations who are brave enough, because it takes courage to work with our model, the leadership principle framework, because it's very different, is that they get a guaranteed return of 20% of the, the, mm -hmm. on their investment in our training programs. Mm -hmm. And so we have a model that is so powerful and it operates at three tiers. It operates for personal growth, professional growth, and a measured return on the business investment. Oh, okay. And so all our programs really come as a full package. And what our giveaway today is part of sometimes when you've got to manage people's performance or you've got a performance management or you want to set your own goals and manage your own performance so you can do a bit of self-management and self-leadership, we have a goal-setting kit made simple. Oh. And so what it is, it's under the uh, Mapping My Life for Change. And we talk about change. Change isn't really change. Change is really learning. Mm -hmm. And once you learn something, then, of course, change happens. Mm -hmm. So what we have in our kit, we have our vision board. And how you use a vision board is there's a journal and a daily diary that where you answer a series of questions, a bit of a self-assessment. And then you put the results using our stickers onto the vision board mm -hmm. as a re reminder 
of your daily commitment to yourself. So there's the visual, there's the conversation that we have, and we'll include the 30-minute coaching session to get, to kickstart you on your way. Yeah. And that's our giveaway. So to be in the running to win this prize, in the chat, in 25 words or less, explain why you would want our Mapping My Life for Change. Wow. setting made simple. Oh. That's fantastic. Wow. <laughs> and it is valued at well over $200. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, that's that's wonderful, Denise. Gosh, uh, well, we've, uh, we've started uh, and you've certainly gone through busting some of the myths and legends of uh, women leading family businesses. So thank you so much. And uh, um, how do people get in contact with you? Oh, well, they can contact me through Coaching College or through uh, the Australasian Centre for Work Education and or phone on 0412-921-134. This isn't a Demtel ad. This really is only one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and otherwise, it's Denise at coachingcollege.com.au. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Denise, for joining us today. Really some great advice and, uh, and I really take away the importance of prioritising things and not getting overwhelmed. Thank you and we look forward to uh, joining you again. And for those on the webinar, thank you so much. And Adrian, thank you so much for the opportunity. And it's always a pleasure to work with you and the speaker's practice is fabulous. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much.